Hello and welcome to our London History Podcast, where we share our love of London, its people and places in the 20-minute espresso shot episodes, served with a dash of personality. I am Hazel Baker, London tour guide and CEO of londonguidedwalks.co.uk, providing private tours, treasure hunts and live London quizzes to Londoners and visitors alike. To accompany this podcast, we also have hundreds of London history-related blog posts for you to enjoy at londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash blog. And I can't really quite believe it. We have now surpassed over three and a half thousand listeners, which is really quite amazing. So thank you all for continuing your journey with us. I'm currently working on our autumn programme. So if there are any subjects, people or places you want covering, then please do let me know. And thank you to Mavis as well, who sent me a lovely postcard after listening to episode 14, Postcards from London's Past. And Mavis has requested an episode on London post boxes. So we'll be certainly adding that one to the list. And of course, now with London gradually reopening and creating a new normal, I have put together the Daily London, which gives you a list of things to do in London for Londoners. And that can be found as an Alexa skill. If you have an Alexa, then you can have a little look and search for the Daily London and activate that. Or you can find it on our website, londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash flash. Now, on with the show. So we are right now in the season of The Proms, which is a classical music festival held every year, uh, now known as at the Royal Albert Hall. It hasn't always been there, and I will tell you a little bit more about that. So I thought today we will go through Royal Albert Hall and its history, because that's a fantastic building, and also The Proms in itself, which hasn't been adverse to controversy in the past. Now, The Proms is now the BBC Proms. And its aim is to bring the best in classical music to the widest possible audience. And it was the brainchild of the impresario Robert Newman. And he was the manager of the newly built Queen's Hall, which was close to BBC's broadcasting house now. And Newman had previously organised uh, symphony orchestra concerts at the hall. And his aim was to reach a wider audience by offering more popular programmes, adopting a less formal promenade arrangement and keeping ticket prices low. And this is something that the Coliseum on Lower St Martin's Lane were doing as well. This was opera for the people. And now Newman is going for classical music for the people. So one of the big questions is why are the proms called the proms? Well, the proms is short for promenade concerts. They're informal, they're inexpensive concerts with an opportunity for the promenaders or now promers uh, to stand and listen. It's a popular tradition in the arena and the gallery of the Royal Albert Hall and it offers a unique and informal atmosphere at the proms. You may have experienced something cinema at Shakespeare's Globe where you stand and watch the performances there and you're allowed to come and go as you will and they're called groundlings. Now, normally the Royal Albert Hall with these promers, normally 1,350 standing places are available. But of course, this year it is zero. But they are offering live and also archived performances for this season of the proms. So there's no reason why you can't stand in your own living room and listen to them. But I don't think that's really that much fun. So the first ever proms, well, how did it all come about? Newman wanted to expand upon his dream. So don't forget his dream was making a wider audience, you know, making it more accessible, a popular programme and keeping the prices low. And he was thinking big. And so he organised a meeting with English conductor Henry Wood. This then led to a meeting where he really wanted to get Wood on board and be sort of like the resident go-to conductor. And in the archives I found a quote, he says, I'm going to run nightly concerts to train the public in easy stages, he explained. Popular at first, gradually raising the standard until I have created a public for classical and modern music. So that was his plan. So start with the basics and build their expertise up to something really quite highbrow without them even noticing it. 
So that was his thought. And in February 1895, Newman then offered word conductorship on a permanent level for the orchestra at Queen's Hall. And the first proms concert took place on the 10th of August of that same year. And both Wood and Newman were keen to introduce audiences to an even wider range of music. Don't forget, we didn't have Spotify and all these musical streaming programmes. The technology was very limited and the gramophones were hugely expensive. So your bandstand on a Sunday would have been maybe the opportunity of listening to live music as well as musicals and hopefully you've listened to my musical podcast there so the informal atmosphere that they wanted to encourage that means that people who have never really been to a formal concert before might actually feel that they'll be accepted this time they can intend and that was really encouraged by the cheap tickets so one shilling which is about 5p was a single concert and they also did a season ticket which was a guinea which is about one pound and five and also a bit like the cinema i suppose eating drinking and smoking were permissible so i don't know about you but i really hate going to the theater or the cinema and sitting and listening to someone roll the popcorn round in the box or the maltesers or whatever it is and some people really need to learn to close their mouths when they eat so i assume it was as annoying back then as it is now And also the smoking, and this is something, thankfully, we have changed. They were encouraged not to light up when a singer was performing, but otherwise it was allowed. Now, the proms has grown from strength to strength. It is an institution now every summer. And they were able to introduce many, many leading composers of the day. That included Strauss, Debussy, Rachmaninoff, Ravel and Vaughan Williams and these are all staples in any musical education. I did a degree in music and so these are just normal names now but it wasn't the case when it all started and then on 10th of May 1941 a Luftwaffe bombardment gutted the Queen's Hall. The only other hall available in London for orchestral concerts was the Royal Albert Hall and that had opened in 1871 and so they moved over to the Royal Albert Hall and the first proms there took place in 1941. So the same year that the Queen's Hall is gutted they just that's okay we'll just move over onto another one and the Queen's Hall was never rebuilt. Now, after the war, unsurprisingly, the traditional Wagner nights, which have been so popular pre-war, they're no longer fashionable. And from 1953, Viennese evenings became the popular event and composer anniversaries were well catered for then as they are now. And the deaths of Sibelius and Vaughan Williams were really marked with complete symphony cycles, which is really quite a dedication And then the 1970s brought another new feature, such as the series of late night concerts. Maybe thinking that, you know, being out late at night is a bit more accessible and more appropriate now. And then also the pre-prom talks. So getting to speak to the composer or the soloist and getting to understand the music or the interpretation and getting another layer of knowledge about the music. And the proms even now still remains true to its original name to present the widest range of music performed to the highest standards to large audiences. And even from the first broadcast concert of 1927, the UK has enjoyed a wide range of both new well-known and much dearly loved music from the festival. It hasn't always gone without NSA say some memorable occasions, including a young gentleman in 1995. A scandalous evening involved a stag party who changed the unfortunate, unfortunate husband-to-be to the door one of the Royal Albert Hall. And just as people are gearing up to sing Land of Hope and Glory, which I do find really quite hilarious, the stag was cut loose and then his friends, well, I was saying friends, his male associates then chained him to the front of the building where he was cut loose for a second time and then they tied him to the traffic light opposite the venue. The traffic lights are still there, he isn't, so I assume he uh, managed to get to the church on time. 
Also, I was mentioning about uh, music of the future. Just because what we hear now and we see it as classical doesn't mean it was accepted when it was first released. Very simply thinking about what comes on Radio 1 nowadays when you're thinking maybe like uh, Tiny Temper or Stormzy. Do you really get that music or do you just think it's a load of modern drivel? Well, our predecessors were thinking exactly the same thing as well. So... I've mentioned that the proms have been known for pushing musical boundaries and they challenged the tastes of the time, especially when commissioning new works and they're deemed ahead of their time. Now, I have been to concerts where I have listened to new work and it's been like nails up a blackboard. And who knows, maybe in 20 years' time, that music will be avant-garde and it will be fully accepted and I would be considered an old fuddy-duddy with my tastes. So, you know, these things are just happening forever. Our cha- tastes and our involvement with music is constantly changing. Now, the audience from Prom 15, however, which was in 1912 at Queen's Hall, the original venue, they were warned when Arnold Schoenberg five orchestral pieces which was to get its world premiere so that you know this shows how important the prawns was not only to us but to uh, artists for launching their works they were warned that it was going to be difficult listening the program even explained it to sort of like manage expectations in the program it said all the numbers end in discord and then, of course, the, the orchestra was known to really have struggled with it in rehearsals. You know, I've been in rehearsals where things have just not gelled, but it has never... Been, well, actually, uh, I do remember one piece, which was just a, a really modern, bizarre piece where you had to count, count, count until your one note came in. It was exceedingly painful, no melody, very, very difficult to get into the zone. And this is the same here. The orchestra was known to have struggled with it in rehearsals. It would the conductor, he has to tell the orchestra, stick to it, gentlemen. There is nothing to what you will have to play in 25 years' time, which I simply love because this is Henry Wood seeing the future of music changing. Uh, And of course, he's saying stick to it, gentlemen, because there are no women allowed to play in this professional orchestra as well. So I'm glad that is finally changing, even though not as quick as I would like. Now, one of the things I will add is a video of Henry Wood and his wife and also soprano Ava Turner on the proms and about Schoenberg's premieres and what they remember. And don't forget Schoenberg was associated with the expressionist movement in German poetry and art and he was a leader of the second Viennese school. Now, with the rise of the Nazi party in the late 1920s, early 30s, Schoenberg's works were labelled degenerate because they were modernist and atonal. And it seemed that really no one wanted to listen to his music. He emigrated to the United States in 1933, uh, becoming an American citizen in, in 1941. And then he dies 10 years later. And I think it's really quite ironic that now he is widely considered as one of the most influential composers of the 20th century. But when he was living and breathing and putting on his world premiere at the proms, no one wanted to play him and no one wanted to hear him. Music from the best composers around the world are performed at the proms. We think little now of hearing Dvorak, Tchaikovsky or Schoenberg, but it hasn't always been the case. In The Proms 30 in 1968, Rostopovich was programmed to play Dvorak uh, the day after Soviet troops had invaded Czechoslovakia overnight and this had sent several hundred thousand men and several thousands of tanks into the country to stop the Prague Spring, a uh, period of liberation and reform in the Eastern Bloc state. And the invasion shocked the world and the orchestra found itself in an obviously difficult position it's bad timing what can you do after months of organizing and rehearsals the show must go on and indeed it did the heckling began as soon as the soviet state symphony orchestra took to the stage on 21st of august 1968 Uh, go home someone shouted russians out added another 
It didn't help that the orchestra and its star, the Soviet and Russian cellist Rostropovich, were actually played um, programmed to play Czech composer Dvorak's cello concerto in B minor. Now, it's claimed that Rostopovich somehow managed to save the evening. His playing was so emotional and filled with the tempestuous mix of anger and sadness at what was happening in Prague, the city where he had met his wife and fallen in love. Um, Rostropovich paid it while tears were running down his face. He later recalled he had imagined people being killed through the tears. And at the end, he held the score high in a gesture of solidarity. And perhaps for a brief moment, the air hung with a concoction of human pain, suffering, fear and anger. But it wasn't to last. One of the final things the musicians heard as they left for their hotel that evening was a shout of Russian murderers. And yes, I did mention that I was meant going to be talking about the history of the Royal Albert Hall. And today is just a taster. I want you to leave with the fact that Royal Albert Hall wasn't its original name. On 20th of May 1867, work began on the site, which was not to become the Royal Albert Hall as we know it. It was a fabulous spectacle. A huge foundation stone was laid during a special ceremony held in this gigantic marquee, which was erected specially for the occasion. It's believed the size of the marquee is not unlike the size to the hall that was constructed. And the marquee was believed to have supposed to have held about 7,000 people, but it's estimated that upwards of 10 thousand people packed themselves in to watch the ceremony causing chaos to the poor police managing the event and why all the crowds well it was queen victoria herself laying the foundation stone now it's been only six years um, since the death of her beloved albert and public appearances were now rare reports at the time said the queen had spoken uh, indistinctly slowly and under great emotional strain before using an especially made trowel to lay the stone uh, and then also in there was a time capsule that uh, they believe there's a, an inscription and a collection of gold and silver coins but what else is in there no one knows now it's at the moment that she famously announced that the building was to be called the Royal Albert Hall of Arts and Sciences in memory to her beloved Bertie deviating from the original name the Central Hall of Arts and Sciences it is my wish that this hall should bear his name to whom it will have owed its existence and be called the Royal Albert Hall of Arts and Sciences. Of course, no one was going to go against the Queen and so it continued with its new name. A 21-gun salute followed the laying of the foundation stone and this huge marquee was said to have been shaken by its blasts. Queen Victoria returned on 29th of March 1871 to officially open the Royal Albert Hall. A year later, she was back again, but this time across the road in Kensington Gardens for the opening of the Albert Memorial by George Gilbert Scott. And if you ever do go to the Royal Albert Hall for a performance, then can I suggest that you book a ticket for Stalls K and maybe row 11 and seat 87 because you'll be sitting right on the foundation stone. And that's all for this episode. Don't forget, we are now good to go and able to provide private tours in London for you to book online. So please check them out on londonguidedwalks.co.uk and I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.